Hello everyone, welcome to Purpose YouTube. My name is Dusty Small and I'm the lead pastor here at Purpose Church. As many of you know, Purpose Church is a brand new church located right in the heart of Bossier City, Louisiana. We're so glad you're here to watch today's message. Before we get started, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know your name and where you're watching from. Let me know what you're believing God for right now in your life and how I can pray for you. And one last thing, as God begins to speak to you through this message, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know what God's speaking to you about. I love to go back and see how God's moving in your life. We hope today's message will encourage you and your family. Well, this morning, I'm going to preach on a legacy of faith. Can you say that with me? A legacy of faith. And my, my, my premise for this is, is going to begin to build on what we're passing on to the next generation. And so I hope that you'll open your heart today, no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey, and think about what it means to leave a legacy of faith that way. If you've got your Bible with you, turn to the book of Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 10 through 12. Give me an amen when you get there. If you don't have your Bible with you, let me encourage you, get you a Bible, bring it to church with you, mark that thing up, highlight in there, get you some different colors, put some notes, date some stuff. Man, I remember when God spoke to me right there. And just write some stuff in that way. You can use your phone, of course, and you can get your YouVersion Bible app. And if you don't have it, we got one, a backup version right there on the screen for you that way. Uh, and for you that are, are really into different Bible versions, I generally preach from uh, the New Living Translation. Um, and then I will supplement that sometimes with the New King James Version um, or the New International Version. And I know if you're the King James only, I just ask for a little grace that I'm using the more unholier translations for y'all. Come on, I'm messing this morning. I didn't get any amens. Nobody found it. J Judges is in the Old Testament. Judges chapter 2, verses 10 and 12 say this. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning I pray that you would open our minds and give us an ear to hear what you would have to say. Lord, let it be so much more than anything that I could say in my own words. But Lord, in fact, I'm asking that you'd help me to get out of the way. Use me as a conduit this morning. Help us to be totally focused on your words for us today. God, change me, and then use me to change the world around me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you study the book of Judges, Judges really portrays a lot of what we see in our world today. We see this cycle that happened over and over again in the book of Judges. They would <clears throat> turn away from the Lord, and they would do what the Bible says, they would do evil, or they would do what was right in their own sight. And then they would sin. And then the sin would lead them to a place called servitude. They would become uh, a, 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 a slave to their sin, and they would serve the consequences. And how many of you know that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to sin, more than you want to spend? You think that you can just tiptoe up, you think you can just play in the waters, you think you can control it, you think I'll just look once or I'll just do this, and then before you know it, you're all in, swimming in your sin, and you've become a slave to sin. Romans 6 actually talks about this, for you should not be a slave to this, right? Because Christ has set us free. But in the book of Judges, we see where they would sin, they would become slaves to their sin, and then they would cry out, they would supplicate, or they would, there would be supplication. Once you get so far into your mess and you finally hit rock bottom, you start to cry out for help. And once they would cry out, then there would be a Savior that would come. So those are our four S's as you begin to see the cycle in Judges. Sin, servitude, supplication, and then they would call out to a Savior. And God would send a judge. And so as we begin to see this early on right here, the Bible is telling us that there was one generation that had passed on and they had failed to leave a legacy of faith. There was a faith gap. And in doing so, what happened? They failed to acknowledge the Lord, the Bible says. They failed to remember what God had done. And then they begin to fall into sin. 
They began to be wayward. They had lost their way. They were living without purpose. And not only had they become slaves to their own sin, but look at this now. They angered the Lord. And I can tell you this. One of the things that I've learned about my relationship with the Lord is that God doesn't just tell me the do's and the don'ts or to stay away from it because he wants to control me. God knows that these things are not beneficial to my life. I don't just try to control my kids when they were younger and say, hey, don't touch the hot stove because I just want to boss them around, right? I know the consequences. I know what will happen to them if they do these type of things, right? I know that whenever you look into relationship, there's a reason why that you put boundaries up in marriage relationships. Because if you are just flippant, if you're just careless, if you allow yourself to get into conversations with someone of the opposite sex and you don't protect, before you know it, something happens that's going to affect the relationship. And ultimately, God doesn't want anything to affect your relationship with Him. And so He wants to keep you in a place that's healthy and safe, where you have joy and peace, where you're functioning in the best and flourishing. And so God wants that. So he's not trying to boss us around with this. And so when we begin to break it down, what I want you to know on leaving a legacy of faith is that it's never too late. No matter where you're at this morning, you might think, oh, you're just talking to the young. No, 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 no. I'm talking to all of us. So it's never too late to begin thinking about leaving a legacy of faith. You know, sometimes our legacy starts by just asking forgiveness. Sometimes the legacy that God wants to pass on to the next generation just simply begins by asking forgiveness. God, forgive me. I could have done a better job. I haven't been doing the things that I knew I needed to do. I haven't cultivated. I haven't passed on. I haven't shared. I haven't modeled what I should be modeling. And then as we we begin to look, sometimes, though, it's not just me asking for forgiveness. Sometimes it's me forgiving somebody else. Sometimes there's a gap. Sometimes there's an obstacle, something blocking us, because I'm holding on to something that I should have let go of. You with me this morning? Sometimes it just means encouraging you to continue on. Sometimes it means just keep at it. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Sometimes it means when all of it, what it feels like all hell has broke loose in my life. It just means coming along beside someone and encouraging to keep on, keep on. It's like what the author of Hebrews said in the 12th chapter, that we should run with endurance the race that is set. Keep going. Don't back up. Don't give. And then sometimes it just means making a few tweaks in your life. Sometimes it doesn't mean that the, that the, the whole boat is sinking. It just means you just might need to make a tweak or two to get yourself positioned to to pass on everything that you want to pass on to the next generation. You're saying, Pastor Dusty, though, I don't have any kids. Pastor Dusty, I don't know. I don't, who am I going to pass it on to? Let me tell you something. It's not just about leaving a legacy of faith. It's not just about passing something on to kids. It's about passing something on to the next generation. There, your life is not limited to your household. I want to pass on a legacy of faith to more than my two kids. right? I want to infect as, uh, impact and affect as many people as I possibly can. So it's the world around us. It's your coworkers. Come on, somebody. You know, you can pass on a, you might not even know this. Do you know you can leave a legacy of faith up? It doesn't have to go down. It doesn't have to go to the younger, right? Can I tell you that I was the first person in my household that got saved? I got saved in a jail cell 21 years ago, and then out of that, I led my mother to Jesus, right? So a legacy of faith that was broken with a faith gap then went up because of what God did in my life. So you affect the area around you. You with me this morning? So, hey, no matter where you're at, I want you to know it's never too late when it comes to our faith journey. And this is why I think that this message this morning is so, so vital for all of us that way. I want to begin with an illustration. Now, this, this yellow chain that I have here, you, you might have seen it as you, you drive by out there, right? So when, when God was allowing us to grow, we were able to pour some uh, asphalt here on, uh, the, the, if you're looking at the church, the left side of the church. Well, we were limited on budget. We, we were able to do a pretty, pretty good job out there. But it's not set up for the big trucks that like to come in and drive around to, to drive on our lot that way. 
And so we needed to put something up to keep the big trucks from turning around. A lot of big trucks come by here, and they would come in, and there's actually some repair because we didn't get it up soon enough, and they destroyed the side over there, so we had to come in and patch. So this little yellow chain here is, is significant because it keeps the big trucks out. But I, wanna, I want you to think about this as a faith legacy. And I want you to think about each link in this chain as a generation. And as you begin to think about each generation, one is linked to the other. It starts somewhere, and each link is connected to the next link. And each link is dependent upon the previous link. Right? You don't have anything else if you don't have something to link it to. And so throughout all of history... We look back and we, we owe it uh, to the, the apostles, those disciples that follow Jesus. They were some of the early links in our faith journey uh, when we see Jesus stepping onto the scene. And then you can go all the way back to the beginning of time and we begin to see the faith journey throughout the years and how we refer to Abraham as what? The father of our faith. And so we look all the way back to these different links and when we begin to look at how these links are dependent upon each other, ultimately, you ever heard? The, the little phrase, the weakest link. Come on, when you're playing sports or you're working together, you don't want to be the weakest link, right? You, you don't want to be, you, you'd rather somebody else to be the weakest link, right? And if you're running from a bear, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just got to outrun the one person, right? Come on this morning, right? But we think about generation to generation, and everything is entirely built on the generation before it. But I, but I want to show you what happens, though, when, when there's a break in the link. I want to show you what happens when there's a gap like there was in the day of the judges, when something was failed to be passed on to the next generation. You can get the picture when you see that they forgot to remember the Lord. They, they failed to acknowledge him. They turned away from him. They angered the Lord. They came out from under the covering of the Lord. And when we're out from the covering of the Lord, we don't have anybody that's sheltering us. We don't have anybody that's there helping us and assisting us that way. But when you begin to think about how the chain together, when it's linked together, has strength. But if, if you begin to pull on this, and if you, you begin to see that there's a break in the link, and as you begin to see a, a break in the link, you begin to see sometimes out there, people forget there's a chain. I'll show up on, on, on Monday morning and somebody has drove right through the chain and the chain is split right in half. Or it's broke about every week, by the way. And I'm going to show you something because it's a good illustration. Kids will walk by and they'll sit on it, they'll swing it, they'll break it. And, and, but, but here's the thing, it's still working. It's still keeping the big trucks out. Come on, somebody. But what happens, though, is when you, when you have a, a break in this, you have this gap. And when you begin to have this, this gap in your life, what I want you to know is that you can still fix the chain. You, you can still fix this. And I've got a little technique out there. Instead of going to Lowe's and buying a brand new chain every time this thing breaks, because it breaks, you know, like I said, about every week or every other week, and I'm like, I'm not going to go buy that. So you know what? Saving on church money. I just hope you appreciate that right there. I go buy some zip ties, right? And, and when I get the yellow ones, they match a little better. So if you see a little patch in my chain, don't be judging me out there. We're just trying to be good stewards of your finances, right? So here's what you got, right? You got a break, right? You got to, something's going to have to fix it. Well, Pastor Dusty goes and he gets him a little zip tie, right? And he's going to figure out how to get this thing back together. And you, just because it's broke doesn't mean it's broke forever. You can zip this thing right up and she's back. To, it's simple, right? It's simple. But it just starts with a decision, See, repairing the gap in your faith legacy just starts with a decision. Sometimes it just means getting up out of bed on Sunday morning and getting to church. It just starts with a decision. In fact, for 70 people in 20 months, that's how it started. Come on, somebody. They just got up out of bed. They said, I'm going to go give this church a try, and I'm just going to come. And when they got here, Jesus gets a hold of their heart. Something happened during worship. Something happened when there was preaching. And somebody decides, you know what? I need to give my life back to Jesus. And they were repairing the gap in their faith legacy. And it starts that way. You know, the other thing I, I think about, which is really cool when you, you think about repairing the gaps. You know, like for us, we have two children. Now, you can also add some links to this. 
And so you know what? I'm believing God. No more kids, but I'm saying I'm believing God for generation after generation after generation. When I pray, I'm not just praying for my kids. I'm praying for my kids, 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 until it sounds like it's so repetitive. So you just need this morning. I think I got another one in here to throw it out. I must have threw it out when I came in here, but I'm going to tie it together somehow. No, I'm looking for this thing. I had two of these babies in here. I must have lost it in my coat. Now the devil's messing with my sermon illustration this morning. But you get the point, right? You can zip tie another one on there. Man, he's got me all distracted. When it comes to passing on our faith legacy from generation to generation, I want you to realize that no matter where you're at this morning, in reiterating, God can fix, God can start, God can tweak, God can help wherever you're at this morning. And so we're talking about leaving a legacy. And by legacy, what I'm talking about to you is how people are going to think, feel, believe after I'm gone. When I'm moving on, I want to know what are people going to think about Dusty? What, what are going to people believe about me? What, what are they going to remember? Because the generation and judges, what was they failed to remember. And they failed to remember because I think somebody stopped telling Somebody stop modeling. And this happens gradually in our life as we begin to move away and there becomes a gap in our life like I was referring to here. The chain gets broke. Something happens between generations. And Judges 2.10 says, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge or remember the mighty things the Lord has done. Part of leaving a legacy is telling the story. Part of leaving a legacy of faith is not just living reclusive living isolated. It's sharing your stories. One of the things that Chantal and I do with our kids, and one of the things that you've noticed what we do with you, is we live transparently. I want to live, lead, and love out loud. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. I want you to hear my story. Why? Because I'm sharing with you what God has done in my life, so you will not remember the things the Lord has done. So you will not forget the things the Lord has done. So we tell it if God's doing something in your life, tell somebody about it. Don't keep all this stuff to yourself right? We share the things that God has done, but the enemy wants you and your next generation. He wants it. He wants you. He wants your next generation. He wants there to be a gap from the, in, the, in the chain of leaving a legacy of faith. And that's one of the reasons why that I think this next level journey for us at Purpose Church is so important, because we're talking about what we're going to pass on to the next generation. We're trying to create a place for families to come. Not everybody is here yet. We're still trying to reach one more for Jesus. And we want a place for our kids and for their kids. We want a place for families to come where they have a place they can raise their kids up in in God's house. We want a place where you can discover purpose. We want a place where you can work out your challenges and work out this and work out that. We want a place that's focused on what Jesus is doing in your life. And so this next level of purpose is really all about that. I want my kids to remember long after I'm gone how I lived for Jesus, how I had to trust Jesus when it was challenging, how I had to trust Jesus. I had a conversation with Gabriel just the other day, and he was asking me one of those difficult questions. And I said, Daddy went through a very difficult time. Those were some battles that I had in ministry. And I began to share with him how the grace of Jesus sustained me. I began to share how I had to trust in Jesus. And as I was, what was I doing? I was sharing my story, my faith story with him. And so that's passing on a legacy of faith. And so when we think about legacy and then we're moving into the spiritual legacy, we're talking more deeper now on our faith. How are you sharing your faith with others? Say, well, I don't know because I'm not really living that strongly, right? Well, this is our tweak. This is our moment to shift. This is our moment where we begin to tie something back together and get things where they need to be. Because here's the thing that I think is so important for us. When we talk about a spiritual legacy, when we talk about leaving a legacy of faith, if we don't get the legacy of faith right, if we don't get this spiritual legacy right, everything else is going to be out of whack. You can do a lot of things in life, but if your faith is out of whack, it's going to affect everything else. If God is not the center and my life spiritually is not in tune, I'm going to fall into what happened in Judges chapter 2, verse 11. And it said, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So if my spiritual legacy is not happening in me and I'm not living it right, everything else will be out of whack. So when I want you to think about leaving a legacy of faith, 
I'm talking about learning to live in such a way and passing on to the next generation where we learn to live under the rule and the reign of God, watch this, in a comprehensive way. Because when I talk about faith, sure, we can quote, he, quote Hebrews uh, 11, 1, where it says, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? But faith ultimately affects every area of my life, right? By faith, I surrender. By faith, I worship. By faith, I love. By faith, I forgive. By faith, I do the things that God calls me to do in a comprehensive way. Faith is not like a menu where I pick out certain things. It's a comprehensive lifestyle that I live. So by faith, you know what, I, I pray. By faith, I read my Bible. By faith, I tithe. By faith, I serve. By faith, I do the things that God has told me to do in his word because I want to live under God's rule and reign, look at this, in a comprehensive way. So I want your whole life to be in alignment with God's word. You say, that's a lot, Pastor Dusty. Well, it is, but that's why Paul said that his grace is sufficient for us, right? God gives you the grace that is empowering me to walk out and live my faith journey. Some of the greatest things that you'll pass on to anyone and everyone is how you lived in the grace of God. And by doing that, one of the things I'm referring to now is how you handle when you mess up. How you handle your mess ups is so vital. Right? We started something early on in our parenting. We do it in our marriage. If I messed it up with the kids, I don't just walk around like, Dad, don't ever make any mistakes. You'd better just fall in line. No, we'll say, I'm sorry. I should have handled this one differently. Right? We'll acknowledge to our kids that we should have handled this situation better because we want them to know that I'm not perfect. I'm not going to get everything right. I might get up in my feelings a little bit. I might be up in my motions sometimes. I didn't want to respond that way, but I did. And when I did, how am I going to handle that? Yeah. Right? Some of us are too proud to say I'm sorry. Some of us are too proud. I, I forgot to tell you to put your feet, feet back. <laughs> but, but we do. We become so full of ourself that we fail to do the things that God has called us to do. So by faith, I'm going to surrender. By faith, I'm going to live in a comprehensive way that way. And, you know, Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So your legacy that you pass on, right, is a life lived in faith. And when you live in faith, right, that's a life that pleases God. He goes on to say that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And why would you diligently seek God? Because you're living in faith. That is the message that we're sending that way. So this morning, I'm going to break this down, and I've got one main area that I'm going to focus on. Now, when we talk about a legacy of faith, there's all kinds of things that I could say, you need to do this, you need to read your Bible, you need to do all these A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, right? We could say all of that. And I think some of those are, 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 are a little bit, sometimes can be common. We know we need to do these things. But what I want us to hear this morning is a little different angle but I believe it is something that can be life-changing for us when we talk about a key factor uh, in leaving uh, a legacy of faith. And I want you to hear this. Oxford University, they conducted a study. And the study was, why would people leave the faith? Why would they walk away from the faith that was being passed on from their parents, the, the faith that their parents were talking to? Why would they leave the legacy of faith that was seeking to be passed on. And they said the greatest factor was the temperature of their relationship with their kids. So ultimately, the greatest factor in causing a gap from one generation to the next was the temperature of the relationship that they had with their kids. So a fervent faith catches. They decided after they hold all of these people, a fervent, a fervent faith cannot compensate for a distant dad or mom. I mean, you could be on fire for God individually, but if you're distant from your kids, it said it didn't matter how on fire they were. <clears throat> it didn't matter how many Bible studies they attended. It didn't matter if you were in church every time the doors were open. It didn't matter if you drug your kids to church. It didn't matter if you prayed. It didn't matter what. If you had a distant relationship with your kids and the temperature there was broken, ultimately they said that was the greatest factor in why kids walked away from the Lord. You, you can't have great faith and be a jerk to your kids. 
You, you can't say, I'm going to come in here and worship Jesus. I'm going to come in and love. I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to be here every time the doors are open and do all those kind of things and then not be there to love all my kids. See, it doesn't say that. It's not even just with our kids, right? You can't come in here and worship Jesus and go out there and act like a jerk. You, you, hear, you see what I'm saying? So it's not just about kids. What I'm saying is if there's a gap in my faith, my personal faith, people are going to feel it, right? So if I'm going to be talking to my kids about Jesus and then they don't see Jesus in me in my home, there's going to be this break. If my kids don't feel loved, if my kids don't feel the affirmation, I mean, sure, we men, I'll speak to men, right? We, we, we have it in our, our DNA almost to be providers and protectors. And so we want to provide, we want to work hard, we want to make, but if we're not there to show the affectionate side to our kids, there's a gap in my relationship. So not only do I need to, to provide, not only do I need to do those kind of things, but I need to be there to love well. Can I tell you that Jesus loved and nurtured well? This is why Jesus had a magnetic personality. People were drawn to Jesus, not just because he taught well, because he loved well. He taught well, and then he was also to be there for those that needed him most. So he had, right, the warmth in relationship. People wanted to be around Jesus. People wanted to be close. Kids wanted to run to Jesus. If my kids don't want to run to me, I'm doing something wrong. Be real with yourself, Dusty. Back it up and ask yourself, why do your kids not want to run to you? Come on. I know it's personal this morning, but we're talking about loving and nurturing well. And so the key in leaving a spiritual legacy is the warmth of our relationship, not just with our kids, but the warmth of my relationship around me. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, what? Gentleness, self-control. If I'm always disciplining my kids out of my anger, fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Dusty, get it together. Do, do you see what I'm saying? See, I was disciplined in my father's anger. And all I learned that if you made a mistake, boom, the hammer was coming down. And so I lived in the fear of making mistakes. So I want my, my, my children to understand the warmth of relationship. I hope you're hearing that this morning, what I'm talking about. It goes further. Nancy Piercy, professor at Houston Baptist University, she was doing a study on the very same topic. <clears throat> Another point in this, look at this, was why do young people leave their family faith? And the most frequent response was unanswered questions about their faith and doubts. So not only was it the warmth of the relationship with the parents, but it was the unanswered questions to the real life stuff, right? Not just passing it off, right? But it was the real life questions that they had. They had doubts. They had concerns. They had things, and they had these unanswered questions. Marilyn Manson was in church. How many of you know who Marilyn Manson is? This was a kid that was in a youth group. One of his main reasons for walking away from church was his unanswered questions when he would come to his youth pastor about things concerning life. And so when we're talking about leaving a legacy of faith, it doesn't mean you have to know the answer to everything, but don't pass it off as though it's trivial and insignificant. Because if you don't work to find an answer, the devil will. You with me this morning? The devil will. Can I tell you, we are living in a generation where people are looking for truth. And so people are looking for real answers to these questions. So dealing with the doubts like Jesus did, I think, is important. Loving and nurturing well is important. And I look at John the Baptist. You know, if anybody should know who Jesus was, don't you think John the Baptist should know? John 1.29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew Jesus was the Lamb of God. Who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist. What happened when Jesus was baptized? The heavens opened. You know, the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And then what he said, he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If anybody should know who Jesus was, I believe John the Baptist should know. He also goes on and says, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. But what happens? What happens, you can have just... 
extraordinary revelation of who God is. But let a trouble, a trial, or a hardship come in your life and you forget it all. The moment the real trouble set in, what happened to John? He was arrested and he was thrown in prison. And it was while he was in prison that he began to doubt. He began to struggle. He began to wrestle. If he really is the Son of God, why am I in prison? He has called me to be a forerunner. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I am not he. One is coming who is greater than me. I'm not even worthy with Bibles to un... Look at that. Tie his sandals or to tie his sandals. I'm not worthy of this. I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize with... He had a amazing revelation but when he was in jail when he was going through the struggle when he was going through the trial he felt like i shouldn't feel this way i shouldn't struggle with this i shouldn't be going through this and if jesus really is this all-powerful all-knowing all-sufficient if he really is the one who was in the beginning if he really is this why am i here and how about this one if he really loved me if he really cared for me then why would i be here it just takes troubles and trials and hardships for things to begin to shake up in your life. Can I ask you this this morning? What happens when your faith gets arrested? Come on. What happens when the troubles and the struggles and the trials arrest your faith? Do you run off or do you run in? Can I tell you that Jesus didn't meet Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego outside the fire. They met him in the fire. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you, Daniel didn't get to meet with Jesus outside the lion's den. He had to meet him where? In the lion's den. Paul and Silas didn't get to get out of jail free. No, no. They met Jesus in the prison. And can I tell you this morning that that's where Jesus often meets us is when we're in the midst of our struggle, when we're in the midst of our trial. But be careful this morning because the moment a struggle trial happens, you just take a little step back. You take a little step back. You know what? I'm going to stay home today. I'm just not feeling church today. And then the one decision becomes the next decision, and the next decision becomes a lifestyle. And I'm not saying church is the end all, but it sure is a great place to be encouraged in your faith. I tell you what, when I isolate myself over here, that's where the enemy loves to play. But when I get in the environment, that's when things begin to change. And so what did John the Baptist do, though? I want you to see how Jesus responded. He goes and gets his friends and says, go find Jesus and ask him who truly is, who he said he is. And how did Jesus respond to it? He responds just like the prodigal son was responded to by his father. The father runs to the son. He embraces him. Jesus doesn't say he should know this stuff by now. He doesn't shove him to the side. He doesn't push him away. He said, go back and tell John this. The lame walk, the blind see. He goes on and he tells all this stuff. And then later, what, is John, what does Jesus say about John? He said, there is none greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had doubts. Can I tell you this morning, your doubts don't disqualify you from what God is going to do in and through you. Your doubts don't disqualify you from leaving a legacy of faith. Jesus said of John, there is none greater than John the Baptist. You need a safe place to raise your kids. You need a safe environment in your home. I like to say it like this around here. I want to reiterate what I said. You need a church where you can belong before you believe. That you aren't disqualified because you aren't there yet, right? The good thing is at least you're here that way. Psalm 145 verse 4 says this, and then we're going to transition into the next part of this. It says, let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts and let them proclaim your power. So what I want to do next in this is I want to invite a couple up. I've been bringing our people up. So I'm going to invite Sederic and Erica to join me on the platform. Would you welcome them as they join me up here on the platform? So what I wanted to do is obviously we're talking about leaving the legacy of faith. Um, you guys have two children. Kind of introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us just give us a little snippet. Um, tell us you know, a little bit about yourself. You got kids, whatever. Maybe even give me, uh, just take two minutes here and tell me about how you found Purpose Church, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, so Derek, um, we have four. Um, the two that I have from my first marriage, and then we have Lyric and Aramis through our marriage. And, you know, I just thank God for allowing me to be in a position to be their father in the midst of the things that. I'll be sharing a little bit later, but it's just a great thing to be in this position to be a father to leave a legacy for our children. Yes, so 
Um, hey, I'm Erica. Um, again, just grateful to be here. Um, we'll be married for eight years in December. <laughs> um, and just excited to share about what, this is right on time as far as legacy. So it's incredible that, you know, the Lord put this on your heart because this is really where we are right now. Awesome. So, you know, what I want us to communicate here is that there'll be some things I think in your life, like all of us, that, hey, I feel like I'm really getting this one good. I, I feel like, hey, these are some areas that we're still working on, some things we're still trying to figure out. There's going to be some parts of your story I know here in just a second where there was some like bumps in the journey. There might have been some moments where like some parts of the chain were broke and you all had to figure out as a couple how you were going to repair some of the gaps and, and how you were going to begin to lead your children and then lead others around you that way. So the first question that I wanted to, to, to drop on us is talk to me about what had uh, the greatest impact on your faith journey growing up. Now, that might be some bad stuff, you know. Sometimes we learn what to do by learning what not to do. Come on. So talk to me about that. What, what had the greatest impact on y'all? Yes, yeah, so ever since I was uh, born, I've been in church all my life for 37 years going to church. And uh, thank God for uh, my parents. And also I was a PK. So it has been an ongoing thing that PKs are the worst kids. Not one bad, you know it. <laughs> But, you know, I have my share in things. But um, throughout the times that, you know, it has some good things, obviously, that I'm here at church, still being planted in church and have a desire to come to church. Mm -hmm. But um, it was also some things that uh, when I was a kid, I started questioning, and a lot of things that I was thinking was right, but it wasn't pre presented as being right. And, you know, when you're a child, you're not able to say certain things or fully connect to what it is what you're thinking. So... Um, throughout the time that I struggled with areas of believing and really having that authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I was going off my relationship based off parents or people that I was amongst. Just seeing their faith walk and then saying, hey, that's what I'm going to do. But it continued to be a struggle in my life to see that God started to wake me up to realize it's not about others. You can, you know, view them as their faith walk, but it's about me and you. And um, before I end this, but when I was 13 years old, I started experiencing, I started to have epilepsy. And I had it for 13 years straight, from 13 to 26, until I met my wife. And the whole time, it was a mess with my faith, because every time I went to the doctor or the hospital, it always happened early in the morning when I was asleep. It never happened throughout the day, but anytime they did a test on me, on my brain, they couldn't find nothing. You know, they, they put me on medication while I was taking two pills in the morning, three pills at night for 13 years straight. So it, it affected my faith to be alone, to stay alone, or just to prevent me from doing what God has called me to do because of fear within. So it messed with my, my confidence. So until I met my wife, she um, seen me, and she was like, look, nothing's wrong with you. Because it was like I was afraid to share with her that I had epilepsy, you know. But she was like, you know what? Nothing's wrong with you. Get off the medicine. I'm like, you're crazy, you know? <laughs> like, I've been taking pills for 13 years, but you saying to get off this? There's nothing wrong with you. But I took a, a leap of faith and got off the medicine. And I've been free from having epilepsy since 26, and now I'm 37 and haven't had any no more. So uh, that right there... I started seeing God doing things in my life because I gave up that fear of thinking that something was wrong with me. So um, that was a big impact. And then just being who I am now is trusting in God and being here. So what I hear you saying a little bit there is that there was a season of your life where you were almost borrowing your faith, maybe, yes. from your parents. You were like, you were living under that. And you were trying to figure out how to shift into your own personal relationship yes. with the Lord and step out into you know, where I'm learning to walk with Jesus on my own. Yeah. And so you had some struggles one there, and it sounds like the, the biggest factor was just your fear, just fear in general. Most definitely. Yeah, and for me, it was the opposite, because I grew up in a household that would drop me off at church and then go do something else. So the church raised me um, from the time that I was like four or five, but my mom never went with me and my dad wasn't in the house, so I get dropped off. Um, but 
through that, the, with the question of, you know, what about your childhood, it was kind of the absence of not having anything else to rely on but God. And sh God keeping me through so many things, um, just growing up, it just helped me, or I'm just blessed to be able to say that because my life was set up that way, I couldn't deny God. Yeah. and all the things that I had gone through. So, you know, my husband speaks on, you know, what happened with that situation, but that's how I've lived my life. God positioned me to do that, and I'm so grateful for that. So there was a spiritual gap from your parents to your life, but you're also testifying that because of what was happening around you, others were pouring into you. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so again, that's one of the reasons why being in community is so vital. If, if there's not a local church doing these things, where does somebody like Erica, right, where is she going to get connected in her faith journey? So it's, it is, it's not just what we pass on to our kids, but I also hear what you're saying is that, thank God that you, you were at least getting dropped off at the church oh, yeah. and the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Wow, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, so growing up, you know, sometimes we have, we have great models for our faith, but sometimes we don't have any models like you're talking about. And then sometimes uh, there's some gaps even in what our parents pass on to us. And I know, Derek, you've, you've shared some of the stories um, that you guys as parents are working through. And so both two different stories. Tell me about some of the things that you've had to make some tweaks, some of the things you've had to unlearn. Can you, can you give me any of that? My thing uh, is about love. You know, um, the way I was shown love is to be together as family. But a lot of things that I wasn't taught is how to actually do it. You know, um, I was the type of person that if I seen it, I did it, you know, without understanding, you know. And when I grew up and got married, it started to reveal itself that it wasn't the correct way. You know, um, it's supposed to come from the heart and then also being connected to God to understand that a lot of things that we can model for my parents, but at the same time that it's, it don't normally fit in your relationship that you have uh, me and my wife. So it caused a whole lot of friction because I went through a whole lot of trauma. Just even going through church, uh, I went through a whole lot where it did affect my marriage because I was still trying to hold on to what I understood on how to love or how it should be in the mix of controlling in a sense. And I had to understand that just hearing my wife because I didn't find, uh, receive Christ in my life until I met my wife until I was 26. But the fact that I was portraying as I, was, I knew God because I've been in church all my life, it caused me to be uh, a posture of, like, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. Mm. And when I go back to the seizures, and um, a couple, last year I found out why I was having it, because I wasn't being myself or who God has called me to be. I was struggling because I knew that I wanted to be happy. I wanted to do the things that God called me to do. But I couldn't because I was arrested to the things that I was doing constantly. So uh, last year, I literally found out that, hey, it's, it wasn't nothing that was wrong with you. It was that it's the things that you were dealing with, with inside. Because in 2013, um, I got in trouble. I got arrested and everything. And that's when God turned me upside down. And what I had to realize that when I was turning upside down, it wasn't a bad thing. It was things that was falling out that was, in a, part of, that was a part of my life was supposed to be. But I was blocking the things because I was used to the things that I grew up with. So um, the fact that in my uh, parents' uh, marriage, you know, it was, it was great, but it had some things that was affecting me as being a son. Because I'm always the type of person that, look, if you give me what I need, like, I can go. You know, but it was things that they was dealing with that I could not, they, they could not give me. So it's like I'm trying to figure it out on my own, but I didn't have enough to do it on my own. So uh, it really taught me that regardless of what parents go through, we got to put our trust in the Lord fully. Yeah. You know, and that's what I have learned. Like, you know, I went through a season having unforgiveness in my heart because I felt like that, well, you're my parents, that you should know because I'm your child. But I had to understand that they was going through seasons of their life that, they didn't fully understand until now. Yeah. Do you guys have any specific examples? Like when you think about some of those challenges to help us um, kind of see what it looked like to overcome 
some of those particular things? Yeah, so it's right on target with what we're talking about. It's having the level of faith to trust that God is going to connect the pieces of the things that we can't see. And specifically, um, if we want to talk about like with children and like how we're parenting or just what we went or what I went through, what we've shared together, we, you have to get to a point to where you realize that as human, we are imperfect and God is the only perfect being. And when you surrender to the idea and the understanding that no matter how hard you try to fix things, there are some things that you just have to give up and give over to God and surrender. And when you start digging deeper into that, that is the substance of what faith is. Because we go through things every single day. The enemy's always trying to do something every single day because we are in his world. So when you surrender and really take those moments to say, okay, God, I'm going to not try to fix this on my own. I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to trust you. Just growing that faith and being honest and open and transparent with it, um, God always comes through. Gotcha. Well, one last question for us here on this one, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically about um, in the dealing with the tougher questions in life, you know, like, so one of the, the questions that I'll get as a parent, like, so I've shared my story, you know, and I um, am vulnerable with, like, my drug addiction and things. So my kids will ask me some of those questions about that. Like, and so in sharing where my life was, let's say when your kids begin to have, and they're still young and they're probably not quite there on asking some of those tougher, deeper questions, but what's going to be an approach from you guys in handling those tougher questions, like when John the Baptist is asking this kind of thing? What about when Lyric and Hermias are asking those questions? What's going to be your approach? Um, I know for sure that we've talked about this a lot, and it's about being honest and being authentic about the choices that we've made um, and how we have had to struggle through certain things because of the choices that we made um, and trusting that the way that we love our kids, that they will honor our they will be able to see that we are imperfect people, but still, like you spoke to the relationship that they have with us, that they'll be able to not do what we did. Because I tell, you know, Sederic all the time, you know, had I knew what I knew then, I would have done things differently. Yeah. So it's not about, for at least for me, and I know we probably share the same thing, but I want to be honest with my kids. You know, I don't want, when you spoke about, you know, not having those unanswered questions, that is the enemy's playground, you know, because they start putting together all kind of other stuff. So I think that for us handling it with a space of authenticity, being honest, uh, and just sharing the truth and how God really is the reason why we were able to make it through those times. Love that. Yeah, so uh, me being honest with my uh, children is because I dealt with anger, you know, just throughout the time, again, being in church, being uh, not able to speak like the truth or what I've seen, so it kept me paused and muted while I started dwelling in things inside that started to affect me inside. So how that muscle got stronger, it got stronger in my relationship with my marriage, with my kids, because like you were saying that we should practice self-control. I didn't have self-control because of things I was still dealing with the hurt inside. And my kids seen that. You know, it put fear in them, so it just shows that you can leave a legacy of fear in your children as well, but that's the things that we don't want to do. So um, I had to stop and pause and realize that what type of effect I was causing my kids through to the things I haven't healed from. You know, uh, my wife has shared me a while back that, you know, the uh, word says about um, no weapons formed against us shall prosper. And when she made the statement, what if you are the weapon that's causing to prosper in your life and yourself? And I was like, wow, I am the weapon, you know, that is formed against me, that I'm causing these things to happen. And understanding that the true enemy is the inner me. And I had to realize that, and when I start to realize and start to practice that, look, my love for my children and my wife is much greater than what I'm suffering with. And God, I know, put my wife in my life for a reason. Even through my struggles of being angry because I was muted. So anytime that I felt like when I was older, that like, I can speak now. I can speak my truth. I can say whatever. But it was still causing effect to someone else because of the effect that I still had. So with my children, when I start to see those, those things come out of them, 
I'm like, whoa, because now this generation is getting stronger, and then the enemy is playing with the mind, yeah. you know, spiritually. So when my kids ask questions like, Daddy, you know, uh, why did you get angry? I let them know. Like, look, Daddy had, you know, uh, a tough life, you know, in the sense of not being myself. You know, I began to put myself second. So it's like I didn't understand how to put myself first because of the things I was going through. So when I start to see them putting themselves second, I'm like, no, always put yourself first. Because if you trust in God and have a relationship with God, you're going to always be first. So um, the tough question that they ask is like, Daddy, why are you getting upset? I don't let them know. Look, look, Daddy went through this, but Daddy is working so hard to get these uh, corrected. But the way to do that is to stay connected to God. That's good. That's good. Well, thank you all. Can we give them a round of applause for coming up? We go back to thinking about one generation to the next. Go back to thinking about passing on. You know, what are we passing on? If I can encourage you this morning when it comes to where we're at, it's to self-reflect, right? How are we nurturing those around us? And again, not just our children, but how are we loving? Are we loving well? Are we nurturing well? Are we encouragers? Are we, we making room in our homes, in our lifestyle for the tougher, more difficult questions? Are we creating the, the platform for someone to step up and share, you know, Dad, this just doesn't make sense. I don't understand whatever it might be. And you know what? We don't make someone feel silly. We don't make them feel, you know, unimportant when they present things to us, right, that's not clicking with them. But we, we create that environment and we create that, 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 that little arena, that little sanctuary in our place where we can process it together. Chantal and I do it so often. We'll come in, we'll be in the, 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 the kitchen area, and we're processing things. We're working through it. We don't have it all figured out. We've not already arrived. We've not already attained. But what are we doing? We're working out the more difficult questions in life. Would you stand with me this morning? As we close, I really want to challenge you this morning that you would reflect on where your life is. Has there been a gap in your life? Is there a, 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 a gap in, in what you're passing on? Was there, was there something in, in your life that you need to overcome, set aside, so that we don't pass on the negative, so that we can pass on something that's healthy? I want to open the altars this morning if you need to come and you need to kneel down or if you need to kneel at your chair this morning. But I want to challenge you as we sing this last song that you would just respond to the Holy Spirit, that you would allow your life to be molded and shaped by His grace this morning, that you would just cry out to God for, for the healing in and through us, that if you need to forgive this morning, if you need to be forgiven this morning, if you need to let something go, if you need to start that faith journey this morning, if, if that's you this morning, you need to come to the altar. Come, come, get here and, and allow the Holy Spirit to do that work in your life. If you need to just uh, uh, close your eyes, lift up your hands this morning. As they sing over you and you need to invite Jesus into your life, I just ask you to invite Jesus into your life. Start that journey. Reconnect to the chain this morning. Reconnect to that this morning. I pray that you'll just allow the Holy Spirit to seal it in you this morning. You're watching Purpose Church YouTube channel. Before you go, would you hit the like and subscribe button to stay up on what's happening at Purpose Church? And make sure to share today's message with your friends and your family. If you'd like to support the ministries of Purpose Church, you can click the link in the comment section. And make sure to join us live on Sundays at 1030 a.m.